If you want to achieve goals that are truly satisfying and fulfilling, you need a genuine awareness of who you are, how far you want to go, and in what direction. A true understanding of yourself and your needs allows you to draw on powerful inner resources to create the life you want. You must discover your own unique purpose. You must develop a vision that reflects your inner values, and then you must formulate the goals and strategies that are necessary to bring that vision to life. Emmett Miller calls the result of this vital process personal excellence. It's a basic and thorough system for inner fulfillment. Personal excellence allows you to gain greater self-respect and confidence and to enjoy not only your accomplishments, but also the process of achieving them. Dr. Emmett Miller is a nationally recognized authority in the field of psychophysiological medicine, which relates mental processes to physical health and optimum performance. He is medical director of the Cancer Support and Education Center in Menlo Park, California, and is a frequent lecturer at major medical education centers. Dr. Miller is a successful author and a respected consultant in the areas of stress management and optimal efficiency in business. And now, here's Emmett Miller speaking on creating internal change and peak performance through personal excellence. An irresistible self-confidence, honesty, love, integrity, and courage. This is the path of personal excellence. It is a demanding and a sometimes painful voyage into uncharted waters. It requires your full focus and your total commitment. Personal excellence has three main characteristics. Firstly, the person who has achieved personal excellence accomplishes his or her goals effectively and efficiently. They're responsible, they keep their agreements, and they finish what they begin on time. When we see them, we are likely to notice a proud carriage, calm presence and an attitude that conveys a sense of confidence and grace and even joy in everything they do. They radiate self-esteem. Secondly, personal excellence has a distinctive feeling about it. From within there flows a rich, warm feeling of fulfillment, of satisfaction and completeness that's pleasant and inspiring to be around. At work or at play they feel a strong sense of excitement not only when the job is finished or when the goal is reached, but during the entire process of reaching for it. Thirdly, regardless of what they're doing, those who've achieved personal excellence experience balance and congruence. Their thoughts, words, and deeds reflect their most deeply held values. All of their actions work in harmony with their highest aspirations for themselves and others. You may know people whose lives and endeavors display one, or in some cases, perhaps two of these characteristics, but it is indeed a rare and inspiring discovery to encounter a person that expresses all three. There's no mistaking it when you meet such a person. He radiates the quality of personal excellence. In my work as a consultant, I counsel many achievers and superachievers. Let me tell you about one such man, not a client of mine, but one whose story exemplifies the difference between true excellence and what I've come to think of as fool's gold. This man was the head of a young, dynamic company. His motto was, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. He was known to one and all as a hard worker and a dynamic business leader. The company he founded became immensely successful, fueled by this man's incessant striving. This guy had it made. He owned a large house, a yacht, and was always surrounded by people telling him how great he was. And he loved it. There was only one fly in the ointment. He didn't have time for his family. In time, his wife and children drifted away. His true friends found him increasingly unavailable, much too busy. And soon he was left with nothing but company yes-men and lawyers to give him a false sense of companionship and security. One day, at the height of his success, he made a terrible discovery. He realized that all his money, his prestige, and his power brought him nothing but emptiness, because the one place he might have been able to enjoy it no longer existed. It was too late to repair the marriage, the family, and the community of personal friends he had abandoned for the sake of financial achievement and power. Not long ago, 
The same man drove one of his bright red Ferraris off a cliff in Big Sur, just a few miles south of Carmel. His passion for the outward symbols of success had become confused with what success is really all about. His motive did not stem from inner values, but arose from the distorted belief that he was not enough, that he was only as good as his bottom line, his image as the top banana. And then it all crumbled. It's a horrible discovery that you've squandered your precious life's energy and life's work for a shiny handful of fool's gold. This is the drama of the workaholic. Millions of tragedies like this one take place every day in greater or lesser form. Of course, some people do manage to make it to very important, powerful, and apparently very successful positions in life through this kind of high-stress lifestyle. They're paraded across magazine covers and TV screens as self-made millionaires and examples of what the American dream is supposedly all about. What you don't get to see is their deep feelings of despair, the lack of inner fulfillment they have to drown in alcohol that night after the cameras have gone home. This is a common outcome when we delude ourselves into believing we are indestructible and the motivation stems from their dependence on other worth rather than on self-worth. The belief that what I have is what I am. Those who achieve personal excellence know they are enough. They know that the scorecard of life is not concerned with who died with the most toys or kept up with the Joneses. The call of personal excellence speaks to us of a greater, a much more demanding standard, that the force that guides our lives must be directed towards a clear vision which expresses our deeper values and our personal purpose. Ralph Waldo Emerson put it very simply, though we may search the world over for the beautiful, we find it within or we find it not. Who am I? What is a human being? What is the value of my life? If I believe I am worthless, then I can get fat. I can use alcohol and drugs to ease the pain of living. My relationships are as meaningless as my life. My success or failure is, in the final analysis, unimportant. But if I believe my life to be valuable, even sacred, then I have the responsibility to develop my potential along the paths of excellence, to be the best me I can be. What we're talking about here is your attitude. In an aircraft, the word attitude means the angle at which the plane meets the wind, whether the wings are level with the horizon, and whether it is climbing or descending. The airplane pilot who is not responsible for the attitude of his craft is in deep trouble. And likewise, any person who has not taken charge of his own beliefs, attitudes, and expectations runs a similar risk. Your attitude as a person describes how you hold yourself in relationship to the environment in which you live. And how you hold yourself in relationship to your environment will determine where you go and how you get there. Shakespeare, in one of his gloomier moods, once described life as a brief candle. On reading these words, George Bernard Shaw replied, Life is no brief candle to me. It is a sort of splendid torch which I've got hold of for the moment, and I want to make it burn as bright as possible before handing it on to future generations. Imagine the impact and power that could become available to you were you to cultivate such an attitude. Clearly, attitudes are a central factor in personal excellence. They arise from our beliefs, and they determine our expectations of the future. One of my favorite stories is that of the three stonecutters. Side by side, each was hard at work performing what was apparently the same set of actions, chipping away at stones. When the first was asked what he was doing, he replied, I'm earning a living by cutting these stones, and a miserably hard way to make a living it is. When the second was asked, what are you doing? He answered by holding one of the squared off stones up at eye level. I'm forming building bricks by cutting each stone exactly 11 inches by 7 inches by 5 inches, he replied, indicating one of the carefully chiseled edges. The answer of the third stone cutter was different still. I'm cutting stones, he said, for the most beautiful cathedral ever built by man. Three men doing identical work three totally different attitudes. Now, which one of them would you want cutting stones for your house? 
And it doesn't make any difference if we are talking about stone cutters or auto workers, secretaries or fathers. The principle remains the same. I've met wealthy presidents of large corporations who are still just earning a living, and waitresses who are building cathedrals. Our attitudes determine our experience, and not surprisingly, the quality of our work. In addition to helping to determine your mood and your behavior, your attitudes strongly influence your health, well-being, and performance. In my own life, I've experienced the truth and power of this idea. One of the earliest examples occurred while I was in high school. Although a good student, I was somewhat on the skinny side and was sensitive to the criticism of others. I was active neither in sports nor socially, and I didn't really attempt to reach for an outstanding academic goal. Then, one day, while thumbing through Bartlett's familiar quotations, I discovered an intriguing statement attributed to Theodore Roosevelt, a man who, though weak and sickly as a child, went on to become president of the United States and the leader of the famed Rough Riders. I wrote this quote on a scrap of paper and carried it with me for several months, referring to it from time to time. At about the time I had it fully memorized, I had already incorporated its spirit into my life, the course of which was forever changed. Mr. Roosevelt said, Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, though checkered by failure, than to take rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much, because they live in that gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. Such is the power of a high-quality idea. It awakened in me an awareness of a personal value I had never before glimpsed. Suddenly, failure was just a square on a checkerboard instead of an ominous, impenetrable barrier. This discovery was the dawning of my first strong sense of my personal values and my personal power. But we need to ask, what are values? Where do they come from? How do they influence our attitudes and performance? Values give rise to attitudes. And if you completely know someone's values, you'll probably be able to tell what their attitudes are. Your values are deeply held beliefs about what is important, precious, or sacred to you. The values that are currently guiding your life can be determined by looking at your behavior. But as we all know, sometimes we are unhappy with our behavior. We eat when we don't want to, we drink when we don't want to, we fail to spend time with those we love, and so on. When we feel this unhappiness, it is a good sign, because it reveals that we are aware of a conflict in values. Our deeper or true values are conflicting with the sort of temporary values that we've picked up from our environment. Like everyone else, we've adopted patterns to ease the discomfort, to win social approval, or to avoid the weight of personal responsibility. But we do have a choice in these matters. Will we go on following superficial values, or will we choose to discover what is deeply meaningful to us, our true values? We must have the courage to look at those maps that have been guiding us and to ask ourselves deeply and honestly, to what degree do we still want to use them as major factors in the decisions we make in life? Perhaps old ideas and behaviors have served their usefulness. Perhaps we've outgrown them and need to make room for more appropriate ones. The next step, then, is to discover your values and to develop a lifestyle which is in harmony with them so that everything you think and say and do is consistent with those values. When one has the self-respect to know his values and the self-confidence to express them, the result is true self-esteem. Simple as this principle may be, few of us have managed to live our lives with this level of integrity. When you heard the stonecutter story a little while ago, did you get the feeling that the person who believed he was building a cathedral was more evolved or more right in his values than others? It's important to be careful about judging others in this way. The first man wanted money, and indeed may have been acting in accordance with his deepest value. He might have needed the money to pay for surgery to save his daughter's eyesight. The second man, who was into the technique and technology of stone cutting, might have been an artist who was deeply interested in working with the materials. 
when you allow yourself to ask what is important to you, when you ask it as honestly as possible, feel safe in accepting the personal values that arise. In time, one's values may change. Accept your values as you find them. If you permit yourself to experience your inner timetable, and if you nurture those values with an open, willing heart, they will continuously evolve to a higher level. Your attitude will gradually become the attitude that you would expect from someone who holds these values, an attitude that grows in a living, organic way from the fertility of your values. Gradually, you will notice changes in all aspects of your behavior. The human spirit seeks meaning. It finds meaning when it serves one's deepest values. When we have a vision which is in harmony with our deepest values, and when we see the difference between it and the world in which we live, there arises within us an irresistible desire to act. This inner energy that seeks our highest expression and unleashes this powerful motivating force is what we call purpose. It is this profound, spontaneously arising sense of purpose that orients us towards our vision and empowers us to interact effectively with the world around us so as to make this vision a reality. Examples of purpose are everywhere. A purpose may be immediate, such as when a thirsty man reaches for a drink of water or when a shivering child snuggles closer to its mother. These immediate purposes, though simple, demonstrate an important quality of all purposeful action. The actions that you take fueled by purpose, have a sense of effortlessness about them. One doesn't think or groan or dawdle over the problem. One moves instinctively. At the other end of the spectrum, there is the lofty purpose which motivates an individual like Mother Teresa. Martin Luther King had purpose. Winston Churchill had purpose. The woman who founded Mothers Against Drunk Driving had purpose. Her child had been killed by a drunken driver and her purpose became undeniably clear, to save other children, as many as she could. Purposes such as these, which reflect deep, abiding commitment, are extremely empowering, both to the individual whose life work is so directed, and to those around him. Indeed, this is a secret that our greatest leaders and heroes have understood. Their eloquence, dedication, and drive came to them in proportion to the strength of their personal purpose. Must a purpose always be so lofty and seemingly inaccessible? No, not at all. What makes a mission great, what makes a purpose lofty, is not how big it is, but the degree to which it expresses your willingness to truly know your heart and to meet the challenges of holding true to a heartfelt vision. All excellence is equally difficult. A fundamental aspect of human greatness, and therefore personal excellence, is having the courage to discover your own unique path, your own unique purpose, and perhaps your own sense of mission. To really reach the highest levels of personal excellence, to go beyond your current limitations and familiar expectations, you must make the task of discovering your personal purpose one of your highest most enduring priorities. One of the fundamental principles of personal excellence is that success in any endeavor comes most readily when you take small, achievable steps, starting from where you are and aimed in the direction you want to go, rather than trying to leap in one step to the top of a mountain few have ever even climbed. Clusters of small purposes will gradually evolve into more encompassing ones, you will discover that the purpose is served by giving a good speech next Saturday, learning to handle a personal computer, and managing your time more effectively, all support the broader purpose of career advancement. Further, the seemingly separate purposes that inspire you to make strides in your career, bring about improvements in your health, and to take time to relax and be with those you love, these will all gradually coalesce into a single, powerful, deeply moving and compelling life purpose.
Obviously, you can't expect any of this to happen overnight. Patience, commitment, and persistence are the keys to the evolution of such a purpose. Think about it. You too have a purpose and a vision, and you too can choose to awaken them. Make no mistake about it, a clear, compelling vision with profound commitment to a personal mission, this produces an integrity that can withstand any external opposition. The goals you will be setting and reaching and the actions you will take will relate to your vision, purpose, and value as a person. It's now time to develop clear, measurable, achievable goals for yourself. Satisfaction and fulfillment can be reached only by selecting and achieving goals that cover all the dimensions of your life, personal, social, vocational, and those kinds of goals just aren't going to be reached overnight. How many steps? How many goals? That all depends on how distant and complex your vision may be. The first and most important force to consider is the force that arises from the attraction you feel toward a desired outcome. Where do you want to go? What will it look like and feel like when you get there? In a properly defined outcome, you are also aware of the inner emotions and bodily sensations you will feel when it has been accomplished. Remember, what we want is something that will be attractive to you, something that will stimulate and motivate you to achieve it. A mental image of the finished product, seeing yourself healthy and well, fully enjoying both yourself and the achievement of your outcome. Make sure, before you go on to the next step, that you have a clear picture of your desired outcome. It is often helpful to write it out in words. With a clear picture of a desirable outcome in mind, now it's time to look at the things that stand in your way. This is the second type of force to be considered the obstacles or challenges you face. And it's important to see them as challenges, not as immovable barriers, impossible demands, or as a cause for alarm or frustration. Use your personal excellence skills to maintain a positive attitude and the confidence that you have what it takes to meet these challenges. Here's where the creative part begins. Now list your resources, all the things that might assist you in overcoming the obstacles meeting the challenges, and achieving your outcome. Resources represent the third and final type of force to be considered. Some of your resources are external, some are internal. Your financial resources may help you overcome some obstacles, but not others. Similarly, your social support system, your family and friends, courses and trainings you might take, business contacts, skills you possess, your creativity and your willingness to make sacrifices. All of these are potential resources, depending, of course, upon the particular challenge you're dealing with. But moreover, you also have an ace up your sleeve, the ability to choose the attitude that is most appropriate to and will best serve you in responding to each challenge. Now, look at the challenges and resources you've listed, work out a plan of action that will use the resources, overcome the challenges, and achieve all of the qualities of your image ideal. A plan that will be fun and that will call forth the best that is within you. A strategy aimed at excellence. When we use the results of a process so as to alter or reinforce the character of that process, we call it feedback. Feedback, both positive and negative, is obviously crucial in reaching a desired goal. Negative feedback is information which serves as a signal to adjust one's actions, attitudes, or behaviors. As you work with power vision, positive feedback is used to let you know at the mental, physical, and emotional level that your plan is working, that your actions, attitudes, and behaviors are getting you where you want to go, and it stimulates you to continue to move in this direction. We need to reward all of the behaviors that lead toward the fulfillment of our vision and that reflect our personal purpose and our deepest values. There are three basic steps involved in giving yourself feedback. The first is to stop for a moment and to look at what has happened. You can do this at any point along the way, any time during your day. Take a moment, let yourself relax. 
affirm that you accept yourself exactly as you are. Accept that what has happened has happened and that you are where you are. Let go of guilts, fears, shoulds, oughts, if onlys, ands, and buts. Remember that you are not judging or criticizing yourself. Your goal is to evaluate and analyze your behavior and to use the results correctly. Look at yourself gently, with forgiveness. Cultivate a sense of gratitude for the fact that you're alive, that you care about yourself, that you're doing the best you can. Remember the vision you are working toward and the sense of purpose that you have. In this state of mind, you are now ready to examine your behaviors and their outcomes. Now you are ready for step two. As you take a long, careful look at what happened, allow yourself to become aware of what there is for you to feel good about. What actions did you take that you can be proud of? In what way did your behavior reflect your values and your mission? What specific progress have you made toward your vision and your goals? Let yourself feel good about these achievements. You acted, at least in part, in accordance with your deepest values and with real commitment. Give yourself permission to enjoy your accomplishments, no matter how great or how small. Ignore any shortcomings, mistakes, or inadequacies. And above all, in addition to rewarding your tangible achievements, you must also allow yourself the enjoyment of the intangible ones. Persistence, commitment, and caring are essential qualities of personal excellence that you wish to grow stronger, so you must reward them. So too with faith, determination, and the willingness to give it your all. Positive feedback involves not only thanking yourself, but thanking all your resources, including your spiritual resources, your God. This shows real appreciation, and in this sense, it is somewhat selfless. The third step in giving yourself feedback, taking corrective action based on what you have learned. Discouragement is one of the all too common results of people not knowing how to make proper use of negative feedback. Most people, when things don't work out the way they expected or hoped, merely react automatically, and the ways they react are seldom helpful. It is natural to have an emotional reaction when things don't work out the way you hoped or planned. But for many people, this emotional reaction is all they have, and they go on to fail. Their failure is the result of the fact that they don't know the proper response, that of taking corrective action in addition to experiencing their feelings. From time to time, we all become frustrated. Sometimes we feel sadness. Sometimes we depress ourselves and begin to feel hopeless and helpless. At other times, we go into fear, anxiety, or overwhelm. Clearly, if there is no other response than these feelings, we won't be able to redirect ourselves towards the realization of our vision. Personal excellence requires that we find constructive ways to deal with our setbacks. Often, Failure can be a creative experience in disguise. Indeed, perhaps one of the most powerful ways to look at failure is to see it as a creative experience attempting to emerge. What you are calling a mistake is in fact an attempt by the deeper levels of the mind to find a better solution. We so often stifle and inhibit with self-judgment. Our guilt, frustration, and self-anger are forms of self-abuse. We treat tiny foibles as if they were grievous sins. Personal excellence demands that we be tender with ourselves, especially at times like this. We must learn to accept the nature of this creative part of ourselves and experience it as precious, loving, trusting, bright, vital, marvelous, irreplaceable. The way to deal with a setback is to get in touch with your vision and your purpose, and then ask, do you still feel committed? Do you still care? And if the answer is yes, then the path is clear. It's time to swing into action. There is no failure except in no longer trying. There is no defeat except from within. No really insurmountable barrier save our own inherent weakness of purpose. If our purpose is to truly know and express ourselves from our source, to honestly fulfill our personal mission, to work toward a grand and glorious vision, then I would say, 
in the words of Winston Churchill, never give up. Never, 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 never. That was Emmett Miller with the keys to personal excellence. And now, please fast forward this cassette to the end to hear Madeline Burley Allen and Earl Nightingale on side one. <laughs> 